Welcome to Cool Seminary Tutorials. Hi, I'm Professor Wendy. I'm excited to say that this video is part of a series. The series is a collection of useful quotes from John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. Whether or not you agree with Wesley, these quotes will help you to understand him and why he has had such a great impact on so many for more than two centuries. These collections of quotes are not comprehensive, otherwise the videos would be way too long. But they are representative of Wesley's thinking. Some of you may be aware of even better quotes, so let me also invite suggestions from you about additional John Wesley quotes. Today I'm excited to take a look at some John Wesley quotes about the relationship between sin, human depravity, and God's justice, including some comparison between John Wesley and the Calvinists. John Wesley wrote his treatise on the doctrine of original sin in response to a scathing critique of the doctrine by a dissenting clergyman named John Taylor. Taylor had published The Scripture Doctrine of Original Sin Proposed to Free and Candid Examination in London in 1740. In it, he argued against the concept of original sin, maintaining that, quote, a representative, the guilt of whose conduct shall be imputed to us, and whose sins shall corrupt and debauch our nature, is one of the greatest absurdities in all the system of corrupt religion. John Wesley accepted Taylor's challenge, making a distinction between original sin imputed and original sin inherited. In his treatise on the doctrine of original sin, written in response to Taylor, Wesley pointed out that we cannot rightly attribute all sin to Adam and Eve's act of disobedience. Every one of us, because of our morally depraved nature, does our own share of actual sinning. He wrote, quote, And yet it is allowed. We are not so guilty by nature as a course of actual sin afterward makes us, but we are, antecedent to that course, children of wrath, liable to some degree of wrath and punishment. Here then, from a plain text, taken in its obvious sense, we have a clear evidence, both of what divines term original sin imputed and of original sin inherited. The former is the sin of Adam, so far reckoned ours as to constitute us in some degree guilty. The latter a want of original righteousness and a corruption of nature, whence it is that from our infancy we are averse to what is good and propense to what is evil. Wesley also countered Taylor's argument that in Scripture no action was imputed for good or bad to another person. To this, Wesley pointed out that, quote, Aaron is commanded to put the iniquities of Israel upon the scapegoat in Leviticus, and this goat is said to bear the iniquities of the people. The scapegoat, Wesley wrote, was a figure of Christ on whom the Lord laid the iniquities of us all. Because Christ died for the sins of humanity, including infants, although Wesley believed God does not look upon infants as innocent, but is involved in the guilt of Adam's sin, he also believed that children never did or ever will die eternally merely for the sin of our first father. Wesley also pointed to Adam as being a representative of the whole human race, for in Adam all died, as in Christ all shall be made alive. Wesley saw no inconsistency in the doctrine of, it, of original sin and the justice or goodness of God. This is because, quote, all may recover through the second Adam, that is Christ, whatever they lost through the first, nay, and recover it with unspeakable gain, since every additional temptation they feel by that corruption of their nature will, if conquered by grace, be a means of adding to that exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For not one child of man, that is humanity, finally loses thereby, unless by his own choice, and everyone who receives the grace of God in Christ will be an unspeakable gainer. So how is sin transmitted from parent to child? from Adam and Eve to us. While Wesley believes this to be the case, he does not pretend to know how the transmission of sin occurs. Wesley distinguished between the creative work of God 
completed in the first six days, which was very good, and the ongoing supply of power to procreate according to the laws of nature. He did not claim to know how, in what determinate manner, sin is propagated, how it is transmitted from father to son. It is a fact for which he cannot account, nor does he think it necessary to do so. Well, God is the maker of every person who comes into the world and supplies the power by which a sinful action is committed. It does not follow that God is chargeable with the sinfulness of that action, which is made by human choice. From a human perspective, then, there remain mysteries regarding the prerogatives of God. Wesley is completely at peace with this. He affirmed that God is the creator of all souls, but how or when he does or did create them, I cannot tell. Neither can I give any account how or when he unites them to the body. Likewise, Wesley wrote, How we are conceived in sin, I know not, but know that we are so conceived. God has said it, and I know that he will be justified in his saying, and clear when he is judged. So, how depraved are we? Wesley believed that the image of God in humanity is an essential ingredient of human nature that distinguishes humans from other parts of the creation, no matter how sullied or perverted after the fall of Adam. In his treatise on the doctrine of original sin, Wesley maintained that the image of God in which humanity was created was not utterly effaced at the time of Noah. Yes, so much of it will always remain in all men as will justify the punishing murders with death. But we can in no wise infer from hence that the entire image of God in which Adam was first created now remains in all his posterity. It is the loss of the moral image at the fall that results in human depravity, because at that point our human capacities were twisted from their created purpose of communion with God and used wrongly for our own purposes, indicative of our separation from God. What can be or has been done to save morally depraved humanity? Wesley believed that it is only when God opens a sinner's eyes that we recognize our miserable plight and so turn to God to be healed. More about this when we look at grace. Let's compare John Wesley and John Calvin briefly on God's justice in all this. John Calvin had written in his Institutes that the Lord created those who he certainly foreknew would fall into destruction, and that this was so because God actually willed it, but of his will belongs not to us to demand the reason, which we are incapable of comprehending, nor is it reasonable that the divine will should be made the subject of controversy with us, which, whenever it is discussed, is only another name for the highest rule of justice. To this, Wesley responded in his sermon on free grace that Calvin was not doing justice to scriptural revelation of the will of God. Wesley argued that the Calvinist doctrine of predestination makes revelation contradict itself, for it is grounded on such an interpretation of some texts, more or fewer it matters not, as flatly contradicts all the other texts, and indeed the whole scope and tenor of Scripture. So, if all are not saved, is this an injustice on the part of God? For Wesley, the justice of God is not an issue, even if in the end all are not saved. In his sermon on free grace, he asked, Why then are not all men saved? Not because of any decree of God, not because it is his pleasure that they should die, for, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies. Whatever be the cause of their perishing, it cannot be God's will, if the oracles of God are true, for they declare, He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wills that all men should be saved, and they secondly declare what is the cause why all men are not saved, namely, that they will not be saved. So, said our Lord expressly, you will not come unto me that you may have life. The power of the Lord is present to heal them, 
but they will not be healed. For Wesley, the key to the human puzzle or predicament is the prevenient grace from God through Jesus Christ by which humans are given freedom to accept or reject the redeeming grace which enables them to walk in the way of salvation. This is what Wesley scholar Gordon Rupp called a pessimism of nature combined with an optimism of grace. In his sermon, God's Love to Fallen Man, Wesley wrote, where then is the man that presumes to blame God for not preventing Adam's sin? Would we not rather bless him from the ground of the heart for therein laying the grand scheme of man's redemption and making way for that glorious manifestation of his wisdom, justice, and mercy by bestowing on all who would receive it an infinitely greater happiness than they could possibly have attained if Adam had not fallen? Thanks for watching and exploring the thought of John Wesley with me. I'm Professor Wendy. Please take a moment to rate this video, add comments, and subscribe if you'd like to be notified when I publish new videos. Most of all, have fun learning!